Welcome to Beg to Differ, the Bulwark's weekly roundtable discussion featuring civil conversation across the political spectrum, from center left to center right. I'm Mona Charon, syndicated columnist and policy editor at the Bulwark. I'm joined by our regulars, Bill Galston of the Brookings Institution and the Wall Street Journal, Damon Linker of the Week, and Linda Chavez of the Niskanen Center. Our special guest this week is Peter Weiner of the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Pete's also a contributor to the New York Times. Welcome one and all. We have a lot of what Orwell would call wrong think to correct this week. Um, and so let us jump right in with the Wuhan lab leak story and the press and the parties. Um, This has gotten a lot of attention in the last week or so, namely that um, this idea that the uh, coronavirus originated in in a lab in China was originally debunked as a conspiracy theory, but now... Um, by, uh, President Biden has ordered that we uh, that our intelligence agencies look into it and uh, establish what the truth of the matter is. Um, so, um, Bill Galston, I'm going to start with you. Um, one of the things that that people, one of the morals of this story is uh, supposedly that um, that the press really screwed up here by um, treating this as a conspiracy theory when in fact it was a perfectly reasonable uh, supposition. What's your reaction to that? I find it hard to disagree with that proposition. Uh, in retrospect, it was not given a fair hearing despite the fact that we knew almost nothing about what had happened because the Chinese uh, stonewalled us and the rest of the world. Uh, So you really have to distinguish sharply between statements that are contrary to known fact and statements that are neither supported nor contradicted by known facts, which was more or less the situation uh, with regard to the Wuhan labs. Since then, a certain amount of raw intelligence that's made its way into the press suggests that there is something to investigate. Uh, For example, uh, the pretty much uncontroverted uh, fact that three workers at the lab got mysteriously sick late in the fall before the uh, pandemic broke out. Uh, And there are now some retrospective suggestions that they may have been among the first to get the disease, but we just don't know. My fear is that we will never know because the Chinese, uh, I think against their self-interest, will continue to stonewall. So Pete Weiner, um, the other side of the coin, of course, is that some of the people uh, on the on the Trump side of things were spreading a lot of conspiracy theories. I mean, some people went way out over their skis, like Steve Bannon and many others, and said not just that it might have originated in a lab, but that it did certainly originate in a lab and, in fact, was a bioweapon and it was intentionally released on the world. Yeah, I, I think that's right, Mona. I mean, you have to disentangle this this story. There was this conspiracy theory, and that's what it was, which is this was a human-engineered bioweapon. And that's just not true. The genome sequence doesn't allow for that. There's no evidence of that. And that was being promoted. A second conspiracy theory, which has arisen, is that NIH was uh, implicated in the generation of the virus. That's not true either. Then there's a third issue. And to be fair, Uh, People like Francis Collins did not out of hand reject the idea that there was a lab leak. Um, And they are, along with Fauci and others, in favor of an investigation. The truth is that the most likely explanation is it was a natural transmission. And one of the reasons that the scientists, the epidemiologists believe that is based on history because other coronaviruses had similar tales. SARS was from a civet cat, MERS was from a camel. And so this was a kind of history of coronavirus. Um, I think that the press is overreacting a little bit, and now it is as if uh, it is a virtual certainty or a probability that this was a lab leak. As Bill said, we don't know. We may never know. But I think the evidence still points to natural transmission because there's not evidence to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, the contrary. And just to your other point is exactly right. Some of the people that were, were pushing 
these various theories and or conspiracy theories had a vested interest in this, people like Tom Cotton and others. And they themselves were people who had been peddling all sorts of conspiracy theories. That doesn't mean that what they said in this particular case was wrong or a conspiracy theory. But I do think that, that uh, the context, uh, context matters. Linda, on the topic of uh, the search for truth, um, one one point that um, my colleague uh, Jonathan Last made, which I think is is very true, is that if you look at the way the mainstream media handled this, yeah, they they might have been a little bit too categorical, and they made, made made mistakes here. And frankly, all those of us at the Bulwark were writing from the very beginning. Look, I mean, this is China. They lie. They cover up. They were not transparent. You know, there is a virology lab in Wuhan. You know, there are lots of things that point to the possibility of a lab leak. Still, all of that having been said, um, and yeah, the press may have made some mistakes here. Um, mainstream press, when it was pointed out to them that they made a mistake, they have backtracked and they have corrected. And so, for example, I'm looking here at PolitiFact, which is a product of the Pointer Institute, and they have um, archived a fact check that they did on the Tucker Carlson show back in September of 2020, where they had said they had fact checked his show and said that it was wrong. And now they're saying, they, they're, they're reconsidering this. Okay. Now, but Jonathan's point is that, look, um, you know, when has the right wing media ever corrected any of their, uh, uh, wrong reports or, you know, uh, ever apologized except under duress, like from dominion voting systems? Well, I think that's right. Uh, Mona, I mean, I think you're, you're right that, uh, the, the right itself, um, is often loath to admit they've made mistakes, and that's certainly true uh, in the media world. On the other hand, uh, I do believe that our media has now sort of joined uh, our mainstream media. In the, in the past, they were um, admittedly liberal. Most of the people who work um, in the mainstream media, I think it's fair to say, um, if they vote, vote Democratic, um, have liberal views on a host of uh, political issues and social issues. But there was always an attempt uh, to be even-handed and fair. Uh, and even when uh, they made mistakes, uh, I think they were often honest mistakes, um, mistakes that were maybe careless, but were not necessarily driven ideologically. What concerns me now, I, I spend actually way too much time consuming mainstream media, uh, keep it on in the background when I'm in the kitchen, etc. cetera. Um, and it does seem that in the Trump era, um, the media decided that they had to be the purveyors of um, the anti-Trump uh, news. They had to constantly correct everything uh, that Trump said that uh, was false. Um, and some well, of not that, everything. I think, was, not everything. <laughs> that but, would take too long. No, no, I mean, right, that would be take too long. But, but, you know, the Washington Post did have several thousand uh, <laughs> false statements that he made. But I, I do think that, um, you know, all of us are, are subject to confirmation bias. And so you had, you know, people on the right, um, Tom Cotton being one of the more reasonable people who were uh, spouting some of these views. And so there was a tendency to just dismiss it. Uh, I watched uh, a program on CNN with Sanjay Gupta uh, on the origins and, and the whole history of the coronavirus. And he was interviewing, I think this was in March, he was interviewing Robert uh, Redfield, who, who uh, was the former director of the CDC under uh, Trump. And um, Redfield said that he thought that that the likeliest or more likely origin uh, was from the lab. And he gave uh, what sounded to me like, you know, not nonsensical, uh, reasonable uh, suspicions. And the look on Sanjay Gupta's face was as if, you know, he just been told that the um, moon was made of green cheese by, by a scientist. Uh, Gupta has now actually sort of tried to explain that and said that it wasn't that uh, the theory that Redfield was expounding was uh, out of bounds. It was that it was coming from him and he was surprised by it. And Gupta has now sort of joined uh, 
the new bandwagon, which is saying, look, we really do have to look at Wuhan. I mean, all of that is to say that when media, and particularly the mainstream media, who most of us want to trust, get in the business of assuming based on where information is coming from that it has to be false, that's a problem. And it's a problem on our side um, of the aisle, is, uh, or I, our side of the ideological spectrum, as well as the other. And I think we have to be very careful. Um, and I'm glad to see that they're now at least open to exploring this, but they may be, as Peter suggests, going overboard and, and now being willing to accept this even before we approve. I think Bill, um, as he often is, is the most sage uh, commenter on this subject. Uh, we don't know and we may never know. Damon, um, this this whole question uh, of who do you trust and what can you believe is of course at the heart of so much of our current, um, of our current dysfunction as a society. Um, and it is definitely aggravated by the continuing presence, uh, like a virus <laughs> that is, um, Donald Trump. So, so the, the latest from him is, um, that he believes that he is going to be reinstated as president by August. Um, Maggie Haberman reported this. It's now been repeated by other sources that this is absolutely the case, that he believes and is telling people that he believes he will be reinstated and a couple of senators. Um, and so in this, um, in our effort to, you know, get a grip on reality, uh, we are still being manipulated by a guy who has, you know, who, whose sway over the Republican Party is unquestioned and uh, who doesn't seem to be in touch with reality in any way. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm actually going to put aside commenting on Trump's latest delusion until the end of the program because my okay. selection for the week will have to do with that. Okay. Uh, so I'll have occasion to talk about it there. But it, you're right that it relates to this whole issue, and uh, and I think that I, I think that both liberals as well as media personalities, media journalists. And scientists uh, very much um, misconstrue the, the situation politically and culturally in the country when they do the things that they did around the lab leak hypothesis. A scientist is not acting scientifically when he or she decides that certain questions ought not to be studied because the moral or political consequences of the truth discovered by that investigation will be bad. Mm -hmm. um, now, those are things we should be concerned about, but that's for us citizens to be concerned with, not the people who look into the questions themselves. And this, unfortunately, has a, a rather longer history. We saw it uh, much more severely in Europe in the years after 9-11, where journalists and politicians would respond to a terrorist attack undertaken by uh, people who are motivated by Islamist ideas ideology, they would respond by refusing to actually say who the perpetrator or at least the suspect of the event was for fear that it would inspire uh, Islamophobia and violence against Muslims. Now, George W. Bush did a great job of trying to tamp down on that uh, after 9-11 to keep uh, vigilante violence and, and other uh, you know, attacks on Muslims from becoming an issue in the United States. And, and that was the, exactly the right thing to do. And politicians should play that role. Trump did a terrible job along those lines. Absolutely. But that's very different from a journalist saying, I simply will not report who the perpetrator, the suspected perpetrator was in this case, because if I let the people know, bad things will result. That I think really was the main motivation for a lot of people on the lab leak issue, that either the people like Tom Cotton, who are saying the, this as a possibility, were bad actors, and so we in the media have to act as a kind of muzzle on them, or just the very fact that a scientist might look into this question will inspire anti-Asian violence. Now, of course, we're living in a reality where there has been a big spike in anti-Asian violence, and that's terrible. 
But that doesn't mean that we then tell ourselves we won't look into a question like this because the practical consequences will be bad. That's that's doing things very much backwards. So I, I do hope that we uh, kind of regain our senses on these questions because it's certainly, as you said, in the queue up to talking, uh, to asking me about it, um, th this is not going to do anything to help to increase uh, trust in institutions and people like scientists who we really need to be relying on for these and many, many other questions. Absolutely. Okay. Um, let's turn now to um, a survey, uh, several surveys actually that have uh, recently come out about the number of people who believe in the QAnon conspiracy. Um, there was a recent poll that found that 15% of Americans uh, believe in the core tenets of this uh crazy uh, idea. Um, and more than that, one in five believe that a storm is coming that will sweep away uh, these corrupt elites. Uh, so, and, and some people sort of did the math and realized that uh, the number of people we're talking about here is not just a, a fringe phenomenon, but this is comparable to some major religious denominations in the United States, and many people have compared QAnon to a religion. So Pete Weiner, you write often about um, the evangelical world, and there's a huge overlap um, between white evangelicals and believers in QAnon. Uh, one of the things that's really uh, disturbing about this is that you would have thought, I would have thought, that if you are a believer in Christianity, that sort of shields you from belief in, in, in sort of false gods, but apparently not. Yeah. Yeah. Wishful thinking, unfortunately, I, yeah. I would, I would say, uh, look, you're right. I mean, the, the numbers are somewhere between um, a quarter and almost a third of white evangelicals believe in the core tenets of, of, uh, of QAnon. And that's really an alarming figure. It's an alarming figure for, for the country because evangelicals are a huge part uh, of the of the country, they make up somewhere between a, a, a fifth and a quarter of, of the American population. Um, but even um, beyond that, and speaking as a person of the Christian faith, it's 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 uh, doubly um, alarming. I think there, in in thinking about why that is the case, um, I'd say that you think about it in two different ways. One is pre-Trump, uh, and one is is the Trump era. Pre-Trump. Um, I would say that evangelicalism has been infused in recent years uh, with a fundamentalist sensibility. And the fundamentalist sensibility is anti-intellectual, it's anti-modern, um, it's dogmatic and rigid, um, and it's filled with grievances and resentments. And there's a strain of anti-science, um, and that goes back to, to the Scopes mon monkey trial and the feelings about evolution. Um, so there is a predisposition among uh, some people in the Christian faith um, to be open uh, to these kind of conspiracy theories, along with the fact that Christianity has supernatural elements to it, to its belief. So I think that, in a sense, tilled the soil that made some of these conspiracy theories, not just this one, but other ones, they could take they, they could take root. I think then beyond that, you had the twinning of the evangelical white evangelical movement with Donald Trump and the MAGA movement. And so you had the subordination of faith to political ideology. And so when a central tenet of Trumpism and, and the MAGA world became the QAnon conspiracy theory, and that is certainly what it is now for, for Donald Trump, that is uh, by all accounts what he is obsessing on, it was, I guess, almost inevitable that some number of the supporters who view him as an almost cult-like figure would themselves embrace that um, embrace that view. And it's a, it's, it is very alarming and it's scary. And beyond that, um, it's a terrible witness for the, uh, for the Christian faith. Can I just ask, um, is the, um, evangel I, back many years ago, I remember learning that the evangelical churches were expanding and the, uh, mainline churches were contracting. Is that still true? Yeah, it's it's complicated. The, the main line are still are still contracting. I think the Southern Baptist Convention is having some some contraction, and beyond that, and Damon may know that, and Bill, uh, Linda may all know about the data too. But you have overall an increase in the so called nuns, N O N E S, people who don't have any of religious affiliation. So the country is becoming less religious, generally speaking. That's more pronounced, more acute. 
in the mainline, so-called mainline churches like the uh, Presbytery Council USA and so forth. I think overall the evangelical movement is sort of steady, but some denominations are having some contraction. And I think in particular, the younger generation, say the, the, the people 35 and below, um, that is where I think you're, you're beginning to see a large fall off. Linda, you wanted to say. Yeah, I wanted to get in because I think one of the most interesting things about the polling uh, that was done was uh, the way in which Hispanic evangelicals fell out. Uh, first of all, you know, Peter is absolutely right um, in terms of uh, the shifts and uh, in various religious views. But one of the more interesting shifts over the last 20, 30 years has been the shift of Hispanics away from the Catholic Church and towards the evangelical Protestant um, churches. And what was interesting about this polling data was that Hispanic uh, evangelicals were slightly more likely even than white evangelicals to believe in the QAnon theories. Uh, they were less likely, in fact, they were the least likely among the groups of evangelicals um, in this study to endorse the idea that we might have to have a violent revolution or violence to to change um, this, you know, uh, pedophile-run uh, uh, conspiracy that controls the world. But um, I think that's an interesting phenomenon. And, you know, having grown up Catholic, evangelicals were always uh, a bit uh, of a thorn uh, in my side growing up in, in basically lower class white neighborhoods. They were always trying to convert <laughs> convert me and, and visiting and, and uh, calling the Catholic Church the whore of Babylon and other kinds of, uh, I thought, hateful things. Um, really? In, oh, yeah. In this day and age? Wow. Uh, well, you know, I, I'm old, so this was the <laughs> 50s and 60s. But yeah. yes, um, yeah. It was, um, you know, I mean, people would come knocking at my door, accost me on, you know, walking to and from school. Um, it was not a pleasant experience. So, um, you know, I had some sort of... Uh, You've got baggage, Linda. Bias. I think that's what you're trying to say. you got baggage. <laughs> yeah, I got baggage. So, But at any rate, I mean, I do think that uh, Peter is right when he talks about the very, you know, anti-scientific strain that runs through evangelical Protestantism. But the Hispanic group, I thought, was very interesting because, if you know, since all of this is sort of Trump-related, you know, there's no question that uh, Trump's policies were anti-immigrant. And most of these evangelical Christian Hispanics are, in fact, recent immigrants or the children of recent immigrants, but, but many of them are actually recent immigrants themselves. And you see their churches all over. Uh, these evangelical Spanish language churches are mostly made up of, of recent immigrants. So, uh, you know, I, I found that one of the more interesting aspects of this study. Bill, um, I cannot help but think about the anti-Semitic roots of QAnon. Uh, doesn't get a lot of attention, but uh, look, when, when, you, when you Google, you know, um, killing children and, and using their blood or eating them or something, you know, this is the, the oldest anti-Semitic calumny out there that, that Jews were killing Christian children and using their blood to make matzah. And uh, you, you have to wonder how, you know, I mean, first of all, the, the conspiracy sounds so outlandish and so preposterous that you think, how can it have taken root so fast unless you realize that it's, it's tapping into something that has been in our civilization for centuries? Yeah, longer than centuries. Uh, uh, well, it appears that there are two things that are eternal. One is the Jewish people, and the other is hatred of the Jewish people. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was you know, foolish enough to believe a generation ago uh, that anti-Semitism in the United States was, you know, to quote Lincoln, on the course to ultimate extinction. Uh, I no longer believe that. And uh, I fear that I will go to my grave uh, not having evidence to to refute the proposition that anti-Semitism is on the rise in the United States. But let me segue to the question that really interests me. You know, a question, uh, I think, uh, uh, into which, you know, 
Pete probably has more insight than the rest of us combined. Whenever I see people believing something that seems preposterously unbelievable, I ask myself, why do they believe this? You know, what function is this belief playing, either in their cognitive system or more likely in their emotional system? And my conjecture, but I'd sure like to hear from from Pete, who lives in this world and studies it, uh, my conjecture is that these groups are feeling intensely threatened by the changes of recent decades. You know, they glommed onto Trump because, you know, he seemed to be a protector, perhaps even a savior. They haven't changed their mind about that. Uh, but now, you know, with Trump stripped away, uh, they feel vulnerable all over again. Uh, and, you know, and this belief in, you know, in evil surrounding them, in Armageddon, uh, the storm, uh, and the need to fight back, not just morally, but physically. 24% uh, of white evangelicals now say that, you know, it may be necessary to resort to violence to quote unquote, save our country. Uh, we need to understand this. It's easy to mock it. You know, it's even easier to reject it. But most importantly, we need to understand why this is happening. Otherwise, I'm afraid we will be powerless to do anything about it. Yeah, Bill, that was very elegantly stated, and I think you're 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 quite quite right about that. Um, you know, I had countless conversations with. Um, evangelicals during the 2016 election. And the thing that I kept hearing was um, some variation that this is an existential threat. Um, and there is a deep investment in a dark narrative on the American right in general and in the white evangelical world in particular for some of the reasons that you said. Um, cultural change, I think, is the, is the main driver of that, um, and particularly in the area of sexual ethics, but not only there. And fear, a deep fear, catalyzes a whole series of dangerous emotions, um, so, um, including often, often hate. So I think there is this feeling of uh, in, intense fear, but there's also um, combined with that and, and not unrelated to it, intense resentment, a feeling that over uh, many decades, the elite culture had, had, had looked at people of the Christian faith and, 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 and people from rural communities and so forth and mocked them and patronized them and they felt dishonored. Um, some of that was, it was were, were legitimate. So I think some of it was, was vastly overstated. But that, I think, is the combination. And then uh, I think you're quite right. I've learned more, I should say, from talking to um, moral psychologists and clinical psychologists over the last 10 years than from talking to political pollsters in terms of understanding this political moment. I think the essential thing to understand about this political moment is through the prism of psychology and emotions, not through political ideology. And there is, in this um, affective, polarized environment, tribalistic communities um, and, um, and, and a lot of anger is going on. And people are just going to their, to their, uh, to their corners. And on top of all of that, uh, we know from human psychology that people of a certain mindset long for simplicity. And as the world gets more complicated, um, people want simple uh, solutions. And it's very easy to go into a mindset of good versus evil, black and white, uh, right and wrong. Um, and so I think a lot of that is playing into it. And the last thing I'll say is I think you're exactly right, Bill. I mean, this stuff needs to be called out, but you will never reach these people by just badgering them or braiding them. To some extent, you have to, as best we can, try and enter into their world, not to agree with it, but to try and understand where they're coming from. Um, that's important to do just in human relationships, but in the sort of macro project of, of the American democratic experiment and the challenges to it, if we're gonna have any success in walking this back, um, some of that has to happen. Damon, um, I, as I read these stories in religious news service and other places about uh, about the churches and, and these influences, you, you, you come across again and again statements from pastors saying, I'm, I'm so upset about what I'm seeing from my congregants. And um, 
the feeling one gets is that the the pastors, uh, the, the 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 clergy are really not the leaders anymore. That that the uh, congregations are getting their um, leadership more from uh, from media, from Facebook, than from their religious or spiritual guides. Uh, in fact, their spiritual guides may be QAnon in some of these instances. Is that overreading it? Yeah, no, no. I think it's the same dynamic that we see in politics. I mean, populism is happening everywhere, and populism dissolves uh, institutional authorities. And so you see it in both churches like the Catholic Church, where there actually is an entrenched and powerful institutional structure. And then you also see it in a kind of smaller way, in a micro level, in at the other end of the spectrum, in the evangelical churches, where there is no uh, broader kind of magisterium, as Catholics put it, to talk about the hierarchy that governs the church. But you at least do have congregations where usually the pastor, the minister, uh, has, has authority within that flock. But that, too, is dissolving in, in the acids of populist appeals. Uh, but the, the irony of this is that you end up you, you still end up in a situation where someone becomes the authority and that someone is often uh, leaders of media, uh, political movements and so forth that get looked up to and galvanizing uh, the populace. The, the, case, uh, the case of the QAnon stories that I find in a way most interesting to me because of my background, I taught for two years at Brigham Young University and so to see the Mormons listed, I, they don't like to be called Mormons anymore so I'll say the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, they, 22% of the LDS are saying they believe in this thesis that, uh, to quote the actual wording of the poll, the government, media, and financial worlds of the U.S. are controlled by a group of Satan-worshipping pedophiles who run a global child sex trafficking operation. I mean, that is really far out stuff. And for that large of a segment of, of the, uh, of the Latter-day Saints to affirm that is quite remarkable given that the, that the LDS church actually, uh, does have something like a magisterium like the Catholic church, uh, that I'm quite sure does not encourage this kind of thing, but it shows that even in, um, a more, hierarchical and institutionally based church, there is this kind of, again, the acids of populism dissolving that authority. And, uh, and that is deeply troubling to see that it is affecting all of them. Now, again, there is an added complication for the LDS is that their church has always been very deeply wrapped up with America and the story of the United States, um, you know, the idea that Jesus Christ came to the United States personally, uh, loyal to the Americas before there was a United States and preached in what is now Central America has always been sort of outlandish sounding to non-members of the church and and also puts America at the kind of the at the at the core of the Christian narrative in a way that other churches don't. And that I think might contribute to Mormons being uh, somewhat more susceptible to stories that place the president of the United States at the center of the action, as it were, fighting a satanic conspiracy. But whatever the case, um Strange times we live in, my friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, apparently that G.K. Chesterton quote that I always thought was real is is apocryphal, like all great quotes, apparently. But um, <laughs> he supposedly said that uh, when people stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. Um, but uh, all right, let us turn now to... Um, the fight over voting and uh, the measures that are being adopted in the states and the attempts to pass federal legislation. I'm going to quote, uh, I'll start with you, Bill Galston. I'm going to quote from a Washington Post headline. It said, pressure mounts on Manchin as panic sets in among Democrats over voting rights. Panic, Bill. Um, and I ask you, you know, there's this sense that this is a life or death thing for the Republic to pass HR one. 
And uh, HR1 is full of flaws, and there, it's not at all clear that it would actually make a material difference uh, in, in terms of election outcomes. So why are they panicking? I spend a lot of my time attending Zoom briefings on voting rights. And, you know, I think I'm getting more confused, <laughs> not, <laughs> less, not less confused. Uh, I think the, the post is right, although panic isn't the word that I would use, and I don't think it's the word most Democrats would use either. There is, there is deep concern that the laws being discussed and in many cases adopted at the state level will make it materially more difficult for Democrats to uh, reproduce the narrow successes, you know, narrow victories in states that they scored, for example, in the 2020 election. That is a real fear that to the extent that elections in key states are now being decided at the margins, that Anything that would uh, create new barriers for even a tiny fraction of the population could make the difference. Uh, as I've delved into some of the state laws, some of them don't strike me as being as terrible as advertised. Uh, others clearly go too far. And unfortunately, all of them are driven more by political objectives than by a serious study of the actual functioning of the voting system and the need for reform. So I would, I would summarize the situation this way. Uh, the states are going too far in many cases. In response, uh, the Democrats who are leading the voting rights charge are also going too far. We need a solid package of voting rights reforms oriented to the preservation of what is a core, and for many people, the core constitutional right, you know, the right, the right for citizens to participate in elections at every level. I mean, this is, this is something that needs to be secured and monitored. Uh, there have been sensible suggestions for reform. I hope against hope that Democrats and Republicans will come together around a core package that actually does what needs to be done, not less, not more. Uh, but uh, so that's, that's the way, that's the way I see it. Um, yeah. Well, Pete, um, this uh, For the People Act, this 800 page mammoth piece of legislation um, does way more than what is absolutely necessary, as Bill said. Um, it contains all kinds of uh, limits on political speech. Um, it, uh, it, it micromanages how states conduct their elections when the Constitution says that those rules are supposed to be made by the states. And um, it would not arguably change the outcomes of any races. I mean, that's that's the thing. I, I do not understand why Democrats are going to, you know, attempt to strong arm Mansion into uh, into breaking the filibuster um, on this issue because I, you know, they seem to have put all their eggs into this basket of of HR one, which is a really a, a huge overreach and doesn't achieve what they think it will achieve. Yeah, I, I think that's right, Moat. I'll make a couple of, of points building on what you said and, and on what uh, what Bill said. Um, first, in terms of explaining the panic on the Democratic side, I, I mean, I think what what animates the panic is that we just got through Republicans trying a coup on a presidential election. So that's the True. context in which this this took place. Having said yes. that, I, um, I, I'd say a couple things. I think I'm at a contrarian on this. I actually think that, um, uh, as Bill said, a lot of these state laws, it's nothing on the order of Jim Crow uh, 2.0. Uh, and indeed, and I'm not an expert on this, but I've talked to experts, and from what I can tell from, for example, two states, Georgia and Texas, um, if those Republican changes went through, um, they would not be problematic. And indeed, the, if it would leave the Georgia election far more accessible than any state in the Northeast for voting. And the Texas law, which began as problematic, um, has 
essentially amounts to nothing. And it's easier to vote in Texas under the new law today than it would have been in 2019. So I think that the fears of what these Republican laws on the states are going to do is overstated. I also think that the fears of what H.R. 1 would do are overstated. I'm not in favor of it because I think it would make a lot of things worse. But I think both sides are are reacting to a problem that doesn't really exist. I think that the main concern here is not what's happening in terms of these changes in, in state election laws. It's what's happening in Maricopa County and other places uh, in which I think Republicans, some Republicans, are trying to set the stage to achieve in 2024 what they didn't in 2020. And beyond that, um, that this goes back to what is kind of an essential lie that Trump is promoting and th- virtually the entire Republican Party is. That's creating enormous amount of distrust in uh, our elections and in democracy. The reality is that the administration of elections in this country is extremely impressive and very, very good shape. And now we have both sides sort of panicked that that's not happening. And when those two things come together, what that means is that we're now creating a country in which neither side has any confidence, it's where we're heading toward, that any election that goes against them is a legitimate one. Now, most of the blame, the vast majority of the blame goes to Trump and the Republican Party. They're the ones that started this. They're the ones that are perpetrating uh, the, the, uh, the most malicious uh, lies and I think the most, most dangerous lies. Um, but I do think that Democrats, in response to that, have to keep their head about them. Um, and I do think that the, the rhetoric, they're, they're way over their skis on, on, on what these state election laws would do from what I can tell. Yeah. Linda, um, in the aftermath of the passage of the Georgia law, you know, there was a tremendous amount of, you know, rending of garments over the fact that they wanted to prevent people from handing out water to those waiting in line. And uh, by the way, the, the the law, which, you know, again, I, I totally agree with Pete that the law was passed in response to a non-problem and that it does tend to, the, the very the very impetus for voting reform tends to suggest that that uh, Trump's big lie that there was that there were problems or fraud in the in the 2020 election that is a problem and anything that ratifies that interpretation of events is problematic. But um, regarding the actual Georgia law, um, they spent all this time fretting about that you couldn't give water to people waiting in line to vote. They did not focus on the one aspect of the Georgia law that really was worrying, namely that it takes power out of the hands of election officials and hands it to the legislature to potentially manipulate the results of a, a state election when it comes to counting electoral college votes. That's the part, seems to me, that we ought to be focused on. Exactly, uh, Mona. I mean, I think the real problem is that we're focusing on uh, minor things. Uh, We focus much more on the alleged attempt to keep, uh, make it more difficult for people to vote, or at least uh, to roll back some of the changes that took place during the pandemic uh, that made it much easier for people to vote. And there's no question that Republicans seem to fear um, the idea that Americans will actually be able to go out and vote uh, for for their elected officials. And this has always, you know, troubled me, but it's gotten uh, very extreme. But the real problem is in some of these laws that are being proposed that shifts the power away from particularly local uh, election officials uh, and shifts it uh, either to the state or to the state legislatures. You know, and again, I sort of find this ideologically confusing. Um, As a still uh, somewhat conservative person, um, I've always believed that the uh, government that was closest uh, to the people was the one that people tend to trust more. Um, And, you know, there's a sort of uh, prejudice towards local governments as opposed to either uh, county, state, or federal government. But here you have Republicans and conservatives taking control away from local officials and trying to hand it uh, to state officials. And it's very clear to see why, uh, because even in reliably conservative states like uh, Georgia uh, usually um, was thought to be, you have areas within the state in which there are large urban uh, populations um, that 
because the population is large, um, have a, a large sway in how elections turn out. So, I mean, it's very clear that that's what Republicans are trying to do in wresting control away from local officials. And I think that really is problematic. And, and then the secondary uh, problem is that if we turn control over to state legislatures, as you've suggested, there are a lot of Republican-controlled state legislatures that simply do not want to accept the results of elections. And that is the real threat to democracy. If you cannot have elections which are well um, conducted, if you cannot accept the results of those elections, uh, then you've really hit at the heart of democracy. And that's the real threat in a handful of these uh, laws that are being passed uh, in mostly Republican-controlled states. Yeah. Uh, Bill, did you want to say something about this before I turn to Damon? Yeah, very, very quickly. Uh, you know, you said something with which, Mona, with which I beg to differ in, and I only put my hand up because I think it's really important. There is a tendency on the conservative side to believe that what the Democrats are doing is a clear constitutional overreach. Uh, and George Will wrote a column to that effect, which came out just today. And I think that it's more complicated than that. The Constitution, you know, Article 1, Section 4 says, and I quote, the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, but the Congress may at any time by law make or alter such regulations except as to the places of choosing senators. So, you know, what we have built into the Constitution is the possibility of a disagreement between Congress and a state legislature about voting procedures. And I think the Constitution makes it tolerably clear uh, that Congress gets the last say if it disagrees. Now, we can have an argument about the boundaries of, Const of Congress's power. That's an important argument. But to say that it's a usurpation of powers reserved to the states, I think is just wrong. Fair, fair enough. But uh, there are other aspects of H.R. 1 that affect speech uh, regarding uh, right. political and, matters. And that clearly violates the First Amendment. So I, I'm that, not arguing with you about that. OK, um, all right. So, Damon, I'm going to quote from Nate Cohn of uh, of the New York Times, who points out that um, when you look back at 2020, uh, you see that states that did not have um, no excuse absentee voting, um, that turnout increased as much in states with uh, no excuse absentee voting as in states that had uh, no excuse absentee voting. So, you know, again, th this 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 sort of frantic um, attention to these um, these changes, I think, is not supported by the available evidence. And by the way, one more thing: wouldn't it be a good tactic for the Democrats to try to juice up, con you know, um, concern by the by Democratic voters by saying, "Hey." Republicans are trying to deny, you know, people the, the the convenience of voting, and that that means you. So don't you want to, you know, stick it to them and show them you're going to vote anyway? I mean, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I agree with you uh, absolutely, and Nate Cohn, that uh, that the rhetoric on the Democratic side is has really gone over the top on this, and I would emphasize. Uh, that that actually that's really really bad and and actually that although I totally understand why either a Democrat or a Republican would do exactly what you just uh, uh, kind of advocated there hypothetically to kind of use the prospect that now the other side is trying to make it more difficult for you to vote so you want to make an extra effort to make sure you show up and pull that lever for for our own side they will do that. Um, there are elements uh, that are, that are like that that have happened uh, over the last few election cycles, partially contributing to the to the ratcheting up of uh, turnout 
um, is that people kind of fear that uh, it's going to be very difficult to vote and that the stakes are incredibly high. So I have to make a, a triple effort to actually do it. Um, the thing that really worries me about this, and this builds on some things that both uh, Linda and Pete said in their comments, is that it's one thing for a society to have polarization, which we have had in this country pretty severely over the last couple of decades with it getting progressively worse and worse, and that it can include the, the most intractable and kind of zero-sum polarized issues that are often cultural issues. That isn't good. It has all kinds of bad spillover effects uh, to our system and gums it up in all kinds of ways that aren't great. But it is an order of magnitude worse to have that begin to affect the second order questions of the rules of the game that apply to everybody. Now that because of, I mean, this has been a longer Republican tendency to kind of raise the concern about voter fraud, but the fact that Donald Trump uh, amplified that so greatly and, and ex made it more and more wild and extreme and intertwined with all kinds of outrageous lies all the way back to his first election, which he barely won narrowly in the Electoral College, calling that a landslide, saying that, you know, busloads of illegal voters were, were being brought in to make it so he didn't win more states like California or New Hampshire, to, of course, the ultimate outrage of the January 6th insurrection that he incited and everything that's come since. We are now in a situation where... Trump and the Republicans have started it, but now the Democrats are responding with their own hyperbole, where the two sides are beginning to treat the rules that apply to everyone as being skewed, partisan, rigged for the other side against them. And that means that they're also hyper suspicious about any effort to reform them and make them more fair. And that is a really, a really very dangerous development in a democracy because it means that everything is now politicized, that there we can't even settle our disputes by following these common rules. We're now fighting over the rules themselves, which, uh, which I think, as Pete said, uh, or again, maybe it was Linda, that this contributes to a can, can contribute to a precipitous collapse in the perceived legitimacy legitimacy of our system itself. And when that happens, the risk of people trying to go outside that system and seek and hold power through non-democratic means increases dramatically. So I, I, find, I find this by far the most unnerving issue that we're fighting about in our politics right now, uh, because it is about the second order question of the rules that apply to everyone rather than a particular partisan issue. All right. Well, speaking of unnerving, and this is something we don't usually do on Beg to Differ, but I am curious. So I'd like to quickly go around the horn and ask everyone to respond briefly to this question. Do you think that in 2024, if the Republicans have gained the majority uh, in the House of Representatives, let us say, um, and it comes time in, after the presidential election of 2024 to certify the Electoral College vote. Um, do you think Republicans will vote to certify uh, a Democratic winner? Start with you, Pete. It's impossible to know, but I think the fact that that is a real possibility is, is itself quite frightening. Linda? I'm going to start saying a novena to St. Jude to make sure that um, that happens, um, because I'm not at all sure that they will. And St. Jude, by the way, is the saint of uh, impossible. <laughs> oh. Great. Bill Galston? Uh, I can't state my position any better than Pete just stated it for me. 
Okay. And you, Damon? Well, as a responsible pundit, like my colleagues here, I too must uh, <laughs> beg to, to not take a firm position on this. But I will, in questions like this, I think it's always important to lay out the conditionals involved. I think it will depend a lot on who the Republican nominee is and uh, and whether they whether they go along with a loss or they fight it. Um, that's really what happened with Trump. Like we would never be where we are now if Trump hadn't refused to concede and continued to insist that he in fact won. And even to this very day continues to insist that he in fact won. So it, it's going, if say it's Ron DeSantis or, or Tom Cotton or whoever might be the Republican nominee in 2024, other than Trump, if that person is willing to accept a loss, uh, then I think will be okay. But if they if they decide, yeah, you know, I'm going to try this thing, I'm going to try to push it and see if we can flip it, uh, then all bets are off. Okay. Uh, let us now turn to uh, our highlight or low light of the week, Linda Chavez. Well, I'm going to start with something that I'm not sure which is a highlight or a low light, depending on uh, your political perspective. But there was a special election in New Mexico this week. And Deb Holland, uh, who held the seat, uh, which is in Bernalillo County, which is a suburb of Albuquerque. She, of course, uh, joined the Biden administration as interior secretary. And her seat was won by the Democrats in what was essentially a landslide. She beat uh, the Republican uh, for that seat, um, a Republican state senator, Mark Moores, by more than 25 points. And that was, by the way, greater than Deb Holland um, had won her election. I think she had uh, beat him by uh, or had beat her opponent by 17 points. So uh, it's very good news, I think, for the Democrats um, and um, not very good news for the Republicans. OK, Bill Galston. Well, I'm, I'm going to cite with approval a source I don't usually cite with approval. Uh, a group called the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies is well to my right on foreign policy issues. But just recently, they had an extended colloquy between you know, retired Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, former uh, National Security Advisor to President Trump, and Leon Panetta, who has held every position known to man or woman, including <laughs> defense, including defense secretary and director of the CIA. And they converged on a point with which I strongly agree. And that is that we have a moral responsibility as we're pulling the plug on Afghanistan uh, to do right by the people who have cooperated with us and assisted our efforts, all of the translators and the others, we have an absolute responsibility to allow them to enter the United States if they want to leave Afghanistan, uh, because their life expectancy, if the Taliban take over, uh, is very short. And if we don't let them in, their blood will be on our hands. We've seen this movie before. It never ends well. And I hope the Biden administration does the right thing before it's too late. Well, since you said that, I am going to jump in um, here because my uh, highlight was going to be an article by none other than our own Linda Chavez on that very subject that appeared uh, in the bulwark. It was called Afghans Who Helped Us Need Our Help Now. And uh, and she lays out um, all of the uh, relevant facts and data about who we're talking about and uh, what we need to do to uh, to, to secure uh, their liberty. So um, you guys were on the same page and so was I. So I just want to put that in there. And now we'll turn to Damon Linker. 
Yes. Well, um, I set this up at the top of the show when I first spoke about uh, how I wanted to return to the question of Trump claiming that he will be reinstated as president in August. Now, I, I want to say first that I agree with very much with what Pete said earlier about how on things like QAnon, we do have to, while rejecting the, the, what seems like madness, uh, to try to put ourselves in the shoes of people who believe such things to, to grasp what it is that might be motivating those beliefs uh, about our fellow citizens. But this does not extend to the president, former president of the United States. Um, and this was this week where Maggie Haberman from the New York Times uh, tweeted out that she had several sources saying that Trump has been going around uh, saying that he will be reinstated in August. And I wanted to highlight uh, a very good piece that came out just earlier this afternoon, Thursday, from National Review by Charles Cook, who is several clicks to my right, and I don't usually cite, but uh, he's an honest guy and has written a very good, very powerful statement for National Review titled, Maggie Haberman is right or correct. I might have the, the title slightly wrong there, but you'll find it uh, at National Review. He begins by, first of all, disabusing anyone who believes that Trump is just saying this uh, for the purpose of fundraising. He says he has his own sources uh, in the circles around Trump saying that he actually does, the former president does believe that this is the case and has been trying to get people to go along with it and say it in public to create the expectation that he will be reinstated in August. And then Cook writes the following paragraph, which I guess will close out our show today. And it's a doozy. Quote, the scale of Trump's delusion is quite startling. This is not merely an eccentric interpretation of the facts or an interesting foible, nor is it an irrelevant example of anguished post-presidency chatter. It is a rejection of reality, a rejection of law, and ultimately a rejection of the entire system of American government. There is no reinstatement clause within the United States Constitution. Hell, there's nothing even approximating a reinstatement clause within the United States Constitution. The election has been certified. Joe Biden is the president. And until 2024, that is all there is to it. It does not matter what one's view of Trump is. It does not matter whether one has voted for or against Trump. It does not matter whether one views Trump's role within the Republican Party favorably or unfavorably. We are talking here about cold, hard, neutral facts that obtain irrespective of one's preferences. It is not too much to ask that the former head of the executive branch should understand them. Unquote. Well done. Uh, well done. Now, I will only uh, add that that does not actually close out our show because we are also going to hear from Pete Weiner. If you have something, Pete, again, we don't require our guests to, but if you have some final thoughts, we'd love to hear them. Sure. Thanks. This, this is probably on a, on a good news note. You know, we talked about the Wuhan lab leak, whether that's accurate or not. And that's an important question, but not an essential question. And I wanted to uh, come back to a conversation I recently had with Francis Collins, who's the director of the National Institutes of Health. Francis is a, is a friend of mine and I think one of the great public servants, a man of great integrity. And I must say, I was really moved by that conversation. Um, and there's something important that I think we all need to take into account which is we are the beneficiaries of what, uh, what I think is a medical miracle in referring to the vaccines that we have for COVID. I don't think people fully appreciate them until you get into the science of it, how remarkable this story is. There was no precedent for the development of a vaccine at this speed and this rate. We got it in less than a year. Uh, the president would have, would have said five years or longer. And it's not only that we got the vaccines in record time, but it was a stunningly effective uh, threshold. They would have settled for a 70% efficacy rate. It's 95% um, plus. Um, and that is just, just remarkable. And it really evokes kind of mixed emotions um, because this disease caused so much carnage uh, and so much grief uh, and so much suffering. Um, but because of these uh, people in the medical profession, uh, Francis Collins and Tony Fauci and many other people. Um, we've these these people were givers of life uh, in a year of death, and um, and I think that that's something to uh, to celebrate. 
uh, and to give thanks for. Thank you for that. Let me just add one thing to it because uh, because I remember so well that when we were first hearing about the development of these vaccines, there was a lot of stress laid on the fact that um, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines in particular um, required this super cold storage. And so there were a lot of stories about how this is going to be such a tremendous technical and logistical challenge to get this out across the country uh, uh, it, it, because it requires these super cold refrigerators that are not in in uh, you know general uh, supply and so forth. And yet, it was done. It was all done incredibly quickly, incredibly smoothly, and we forget, you know, that that that's really also kind of a miracle. Uh, and uh, and we did it. So not not everything is is going to hell in America. <laughs> and on that note, we thank you all for listening, and thank you, Pete Weiner, for joining us. We will return next week, as every week. Thank you. Thank you.